So if you miss anything, you can always watch these recording sessions um, later, or if you have to leave before he gets to Moodle, you can, you can watch it later. I want to remind you that um, Jason is on every Tuesday at one o'clock next week. Um, I believe, is it Connection? Yes. Yeah, building like community and connection. There's good stuff coming. We've got some stuff about um, recording videos coming. So lots of things I think that will help. Uh, I also want to put in one quick plug to remind you that if you have any questions at all, lots of you are, are writing to us on all different channels. That's great. But do remember every day from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m., we are in the Zoom room um, that you are currently in now. So that's also a great place to pop by if you just have a simple question or, or need some help with something. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason. Um, the, the rest of us will be here and we'll be trying to watch the chat a little bit. So feel free to use the chat if you have uh, questions as we go along. And other than that, I will let Jason go from there. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. And so we're gonna, like Robin said, we're gonna start talking about uh, Teams first. And so you can see um, my team that I, uh, my team desktop app. And so I use the desktop app because I can organize a little more with my screen to deal better deal with real estate. And so just kind of quick general overview of it is you can see over here on my navigation, I'm in Teams, and these are all the teams I'm part of. ITS, uh, the Learning Commons, Academic Technology, the Academic Technology Committee, so on and so forth. And all the way down here is the ACE four-week workshop. Um, and so this is the team and Robin and, and Martha and Hannah set all this up. Um, and it includes all the members of people who are, are doing, this, doing this workshop. Um, and so each one of these things are different teams that we're part of. This one right here, I made yesterday with Ken Cochin as we were testing some things in teams and, and doing meetings within team. Um, whenever you make a team, you have the general conversation tab uh, or the general channel, sorry. Um, Want to make sure I use the right um, verbiage. And so the general channel is basically what it talks about, just general. It's the first channel that gets made. You can see pretty much every one of these teams I'm a member of is, has a general channel. And then after that, more channels can get created if you're the owner of that team. And so what Robin and Hannah and Martha did is they have all these different channels, the open discussion, anything goes, um, the channel for the reflections, um, a couple other ones. And then I'm in you know, my channel for my mentor group and then the channel for us mentors to talk where we talk bad about, no, I'm just kidding. We don't talk bad about you guys. Um, and so these are the different channels that are involved in this in this team. And so pedagogically, one of the ways that this can be utilized if you want to is you can make a team that goes with your class. And so if I wanted to, you can see right here, it says join or create team. I can click this, I can create a team. I wanna do a class and then I can name it, you know, Ninos fall 2020 academic generic class. And I'm not gonna actually go through the whole steps of making it and then, but I can click next. And then after that, I would be able to add team members. And so I can take the students that are in my class and then roll them or add them to the team. And so like this right here, add member. So if I click on the three dots here, I can do add member and I can find that per, uh, find a person's name. So I might do Erica Rydberg, who works with us. Or you should be able to add students as part of as part of our 365, and you can then um, add students. Um, so Angela asks: So students need to be added individually? Yes. Unfortunately, we don't have a dynamic connection between our student information system and um, and uh, teams and so that you would unfortunately have to add them um, individually. And Roxana added, can students create team, a team in teams? Yes, students can create a team in teams. Um, and so after I add these students, what teams is really good at is communication. Um, you've seen as we've used this, the nice thing about this is 
um, people can pose questions and then you get these nested replies for people to come in and reply to it. Um, and so like in our open discussion here, you know, everyone throws up their questions, you'll get um, notifications of when something's happening in the channel and then you can reply to it. So Angela uh, asked, is it high flex with an I or high flex with a Y? And you can, I can see here, I can see all these um, different um, responses. Um, Angela asked, will the Moodle app be available in Teams sometimes in the near future? No, Moodle, yeah, Robin already answered that. Um, we did look into getting the two integrated and on the behind the scenes, there was a lot of permissions that we were comfortable in doing it to get them um, to work well together. Um, so some of the ways you can utilize team in your class um, is creating channels. If you're doing group work, you can create a channel and assign different members to that, uh, to that channel uh, who are involved in the group. Um, do we need to use student numbers since they're, no, Wendy, you would need to use the student names because that's what it's associated with their names or their, um, you could probably use their PSU um, short name. Um, so when you add them, after you add everybody to the team, when you make a channel, you can then add members to that channel. Um, and so, and then you can make a private channel. And so, you know, a private channel is where only certain people um, can work in that channel. So that's why this private channel here can add members, whereas the other channels, they, anybody can join. And so if you're, if students are working on a group project, and you want to have a place for them to um, communicate as a work to collaborate on their project, one place they can do it is in teams. You make a channel, you say this is for group one, group two, group three, and then you can make it private and add those members so they have a nice place where they can um, chat and communicate. Um, you know, you can have it as a general post, you know, you can have a general channel or a hallway channel for any kind of questions. Um, you know, one of the things that's encouraged in online classes is you have the, uh, the hallway discussion board where students can post their questions of, you know, this, that, or other, when's the assignment due? What's the, you know, what's the point of, what is the syllabus? And so instead of doing a forum in Moodle, you can use a team channel. And the nice thing about that is that it's um, instantaneous. And then on top of that, it's also mobile friendly. I have teams on my phone. I can get the communications on my phone. I can set up so I don't get notifications there. And so, you know, I can respond to it any places where I need to respond, you know, we need to respond to it. Um, one of the nice things you can see right here is the tagging feature. And so what uh, Robin talked about this morning, she put the notice up saying, hey, we're gonna do this, you know, we're having a meeting and then she specifically tagged me. And so the nice thing about that, the how to do that, I can do the at symbol, start typing a name. And so Robin, I'm gonna tag you real fast. And so Robin is gonna get a specific notice saying that, um, saying that she's been tagged. So Robin, can you do me a favor and tag me back in a conversation in that uh, reply, please? Yes, I can. So as Robin does her reply, you can see my activity here is blank. I have nothing that I need to look at. And so after she does, when she does reply to me, I will get a specific mention uh, saying, hey, there's a pop-up, Robin mentioned you. My activity up here did light up for a second, but then it went away because I, uh, I had it. Um, and so there is, that is a way that you can quickly tag somebody. And so you know that they get notified. And so this morning at 817, I got the notification saying Robin tagged me. And I go, crap, what did I do? Um, to realize that she was just mentioning that we have this uh, conversation. Um, so yeah, 
NICs being responded to. There's ways to tag teams. Um, the other thing, one of the things you might want to know is that let's say you want to get somebody directly to a channel. If you click on the dots next to that channel, you can get a link to the channel. And so if I copy that, I can send somebody that in an email and it'll send them a link directly to that channel. Um, so that, you know, so you don't have to try to tell them to go find it in the teams or anything like that. Um, it's just automatically right there. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop there for a second. Is there any questions I need to address? Jason, where is the um, best teams documentation help for uh, Plymouth faculty? Um, you can always, I don't know how much documentation we have in our knowledge base. For the as you guys who don't know, our knowledge base is at support.plymouth.edu. I can type in teams. And so we have some, we do have some knowledge base here. The other thing would be just do search Microsoft's website for help on teams. Also, if we have an answer to our knowledge base, I, you know, the best place to check would be Microsoft teams um, help in general. I also want to point out that we have a slipper camp session on the very basics of teams that was run by Melinda and that is in our slipper camp resources. Um, we will get that and put it in the chat in about two minutes. So that's, um, I think, like about 45 minutes focused just on the basics of how to set up teams and stuff. Yes. Um, the other nice thing about this is, you notice the top across the board here, they've added some uh, other items there. So like our files and all your workbooks, they're all in here. And so it's, you know, works like a regular file explorer. You can do a new, do a new folder, and then add a Word document, any sort of thing that you want to add. Um, the nice thing about this is that um, it can be updated in real time. And so, you know, as we're doing the workbooks, you can work on them in Teams. If you want to access them, you can also have it open up in the, um, um, in the Word app. Um, Roxana, do you mind if I open up your workbook to kind of show you to use as a demo? Yeah, open it up. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm going to open up our, uh, Roxana's workbook. And so it opens up in here and Roxana's typed in it. If I want to come in here and delete everything, I can't. Now I'm not going to do that, Roxana. Um, but yes, multiple people can be working on this and adding it in real time. I can see up at the top that Roxana's in it. She's on page five and I can go to her location to see yeah, what she's doing. <laughs> Sorry, I won't do that. Um, additionally, I can open up in the desktop. So if I don't want to work on it in actual Teams, I have this option here, open up the desktop app. It tells me, do I want to open up this file? Yes, I do. And then it opens up Microsoft Word. And then it, once I can do it, make any changes. And then once I'm done, I can close that and it will sync. And yep, I'm done. I want to continue here. And any changes I've made would have synced across. Um, if you don't want to do that, um, the other thing is you can always do is just download it. So if I click on the three dots that show up, I can download it, make any changes that aren't live, that aren't synced, save it, and then re-upload it by dragging it here off my desktop and into this uh, file area. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a way that, you know, we're sharing our workbook here. It's editing in real time. And the nice thing is that any one of the students, if you want to have a, a running glossary of terms in your class, you can do that and have, have a document here that your students can actually access and work on. Um, uh, Jason, yes. how do you sniff out the cheaters by, by looking at um, how the 
how they've edited. Can you basically track their movements in their docs? This is helpful because I would like to be able to do this with Angela in case she is cheating. I would like to be able to look at how she edits her workbook. Legit. I don't trust Angela too. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Let's kind of explore and find out for a second. Uh, I'm sure that data is in there, just like with Google. It's, you know, it's definitely yeah. keeping track of you. So the question is just, do they make it easy to find or not? You have yeah. to poke around. Um, yeah, because there's generally ways you can see version history. I don't know if there's a way to do it right in Teams. Um, if I open this in my desktop app, Let's see if there's a way to see version history from here. Well, I don't know. I will have to look to see. We'll look it. We'll look into it. All right, any other questions? Um, one thing I wanted to say as you're thinking about this is that we haven't, until the pandemic hit, we hadn't had a ton of faculty who were really using Teams a, t a lot in their classes. Some people were using it, especially in project-based classes to run um, projects. But I think when the pandemic hit, quite a few faculty started looking at it and thinking, oh, I could maybe use this in place of Moodle because it, it feels a little bit more alive. Um, so I think when you're thinking about Teams, you can think of it in three ways, as a supplement to Moodle, as a replacement for Moodle, or as a whole different kind of tool that really does um, more like, you know, group work, projects, chit chatting, that kind of stuff. So I just want to say that unlike Moodle, there's a, actually kind of a lot of different ways you could think about using um, Teams. So you might want to, instead of asking like, how does this get used with classes? You might ask, how could I possibly use this with my class? Because there isn't as much of a mold. Um, so especially Martha is a great person to kind of have some of those conversations with too. What kind of class do you teach and how could we set teams up so that it really helps you? Hannah as well has a lot of experience setting up different kinds of teams to do different kinds of things. Um, that uh, is a great question from Jessica too about the SharePoint um, sites. That's also a SharePoint site is another possible replacement to Moodle. Um, a SharePoint site is really interesting because it allows you to protect your stuff, which means you could post things that would violate copyright, perhaps, if they were posted on the open web. Um, but you may also want to think about the pros and cons of spending a lot of time developing a big SharePoint site. Um, maybe you'd be better off actually developing a website um, or just keeping your stuff in the, in the LMS. Um, so if you develop one SharePoint site, you can use that over and over again with different teams. Um, I'm pretty sure. Is that right, Jason? Uh, one more time in the question. If you develop a SharePoint site, um, you won't need to copy that over. You can keep that SharePoint site stable and change your teams from year to year using your same SharePoint site, I think, right? I don't know. I honestly cannot answer that question because I am not sure. Um, I can reach out to Ken Coach and he would know better than I would. Yeah, because Jessica um, has a really good question, right? You would not yes. want to do that if you had to like recreate that site every time. Um, yeah, so let, let's check on that because it's a really important question for faculty who are going to spend time. Yep. Um, it's one of the reasons that Martha and I in particular recommend websites. Um, the only challenge with websites is copyrighted materials. So those have to stay in the LMS. But many of us who teach at Plymouth have websites where we keep our course and those stay with us, you know, from semester to semester. We can attach different LMS shells, different teams, all that stuff to that course anytime we want, which is how our ACE workshop works, right? It's a, it's a website and then our team is made each time we teach the course, right? Yeah. Okay, we're going to look into that. Great question from Jessica. Angela has the gradebook question, which will probably be a really nice transition to Moodle for you, Jason. There you go. Yep. Thank you for that segue. So um, there are apps you can connect to Teams. 
Um, and so I've seen a gradebook app that's off by Microsoft. I haven't played with it. I don't know the security of it. Uh, and so I would be reticent to recommend that, um, utilizing that in, in Microsoft Teams. Um, that, that's the best thing about, um, about using Moodle is that it is a closed network. Only people who have permission to be on it can access it and it is approved to be used for that, uh, for that feature. So um, hopping over to Moodle. Um, and so this is you know, your standard Moodle course. Um, some things I'm gonna kind of go over that we talked about in the slipper camp. Um, and so Moodle is a learning management system, whereas Microsoft Teams is more of a uh, communication tool. Microsoft has been billing it as, hey, this is where you can use it in all, you know, learning management ways. But Moodle um, was intended to be used in as a classroom tool. Um, so, you know, when talking about HyFlex, one of the things I talked about is, you know, using the sections to organize your course. And so I talked about, you know, week one, face-to-face, -face, week two, online, if you wanted to try to compare and contrast uh, against the two different things. And one of the things I talked about is to make it slightly easier is if I go in my settings, I can change the format and I can do number of columns and change this to two. So then I have two columns that kind of work alongside each other week one, face-to-face, -face, week one online, week two, face-to-face, -face, week two online, um, so, so on and so forth. Um, so that's, um, that's a way to help, kind of help organize your course and the kind of the high flex. Um, if you want to use discussion forums, that's one of the, way, one of the things we talked about um, earlier is you know, a way for your students to communicate with each other. You can utilize team, you can also use utilize a discussion forum. And so if I come up here at my top, so because I want this to appear all, always at the top and I do forum up here, I can say hallway conversations and say, come here to post any classroom questions. I can totally type to get answered. So then, you know, anybody in the students can come in here and post their general questions and utilize that as a space to have them answered either by another student or yourself. Um, you know, when I've ran classes in the past, I always say, you know, post your question first to the hallway conversation to see, you know, see if they can answer instead of emailing me directly. Um, that way it teaches them to be slightly resourceful and help build that community, uh, community in the classroom of, hey, they're working on this together. And I don't want to get 17 emails from students asking about, you know, when something is due. Um, so let's see, what was the question that we had? Is there any way you might add a Moodle plugin for checklists? Um, so I don't know about checklists and I don't think we're gonna be adding any plugins in the near future just because of um, other operations and we're getting very close to school starts that we are registered to add plugins um, unless there's time to test and work on it. So um, trying to see what this does, hierarchy importance. Yeah, um, one of the things you can do is add um, requirements to go along with this. Um, so you can see some of these things have checks mark on it um, to mark it off as complete. And so in order to do that, if I go in the settings here um, and I have to find it because I always forget where it's at. Oh, activity completion, there it goes. And so completion tracking, students can manually track, uh, mark activity as complete or show activity as complete when certain conditions are met. And so if I want to have them a record of saying, hey, make sure you get these things done, I can do activity completion and then have them either manually check it 
or say it's complete when you get X grade or so far, so on and so forth. And I can do an expected completion date, meaning, hey, we can, um, you know, I, you should be done with this by this time. Um, so I'm not going to go too depth into other things in Moodle. Uh, I figure I leave this time as a time to ask specific questions on what you might need, uh, questions you might have to operate in Moodle or Teams at that point. So I will open this up if you want to raise your hand or um, unmute your microphone and ask a question. I leave it up to you guys. Um, so looking at the chat, um, so part of what's going on is the um, New Hampshire Department of Education has been working on... Hey, don't feel like you have... I mean, I take full responsibility. I just completely spilled these beans. It's on me. You didn't hear any of this from Jason. And if you don't want to say anything, that's cool. I take responsibility. Well, you've already let the cat out of the bag, so I'm at least going to uh, at least address what's happening. Um, the New Hampshire Department of Education has been working on this um, and they are working on the final details of a contract that will um, adopt Canvas statewide K through 20. Um, and so um, with that being said, as part of the University of New Hampshire system, um, two of our institutions were using Canvas and two were using Moodle in order to just consolidate and make it easier for us to support um, instructors across the university. One of the things that was being discussed even before this contract was adoption of a, unif a single LMS usage. Um, and with the state of New Hampshire going uh, with this adoption of a canvas across the state, um, most likely um, um, PSU will be moving to canvas in the future. Other questions? So can I ask you something about that? Yes. So what's the best practice then? Do we, do we kind of think about creating a course cartridge that's outside of Moodle completely? So if I'm looking, say, at your week one module, I would have all those in a file somewhere so I'm ready to launch in Canvas or what's the best practice as we are kind of thinking how to design for a transition? Um, the best practice is continuing practicing like you're doing in Moodle. Uh, the nice thing about us, um, well I won't say the nice thing, but part of the thing with the switch is Canvas can, we can export what you have in Moodle and then import it into Canvas. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be some tweaks that are going to be have to made but uh, for the most part, it does import relatively um, clean from Moodle into Canvas. Even the H5P activities? No, that would be Fair that not. would be one of the things that that won't transfer over well. Okay, thank you. That's helpful to know. Yep. Um, Angela asks, "Is Canvas open source like Moodle?" Yes, technically, the learning management system of Canvas is open source. Um, what would part of be common to this contract is though, is that um, most likely um, we will be paying Instructure to host Canvas in their cloud instance. Any other questions? Um, definitely now is a great time to ask any questions about um, Teams or Moodle. Maybe we'll start with questions that you might have about choosing tools or getting things off the ground for your classes, but then we can also transition just to real individual questions that you might have um, for Jason. So don't hesitate, now is a great time. 
Um, I, I will, I do want to respond maybe myself to um, Katie's point, because actually this is something that Martha and I especially have talked a lot about, the difference, um, the challenges of, of tool overload for students, especially when we move to remote learning. I see Angie nodding her head because she probably works with lots of students through the PASS office too, um, who are really struggling to make sense of all the different tools. So you have to balance out the facts that the perfect tool might actually not be worth using if it means adding another tool. You may actually want to stick with something that's imperfect just to limit the amount of tools that you have. Um, and even if it's only your cool tool, the problem is if everybody's got one of their own cool tools. So like Martha and I especially are no big lovers of either Moodle or Teams. We tend to work out on the open web more. But I think both of us have seen a real benefit in suggesting that when we do this for COVID, you might think about Teams and Moodle as two places that most students are not going to be able to avoid. And so if you're using Teams or Moodle, you can feel pretty comfortable that your students, you know, that's a, a tool that is already going to be in their, um, in their arsenal. So for that reason, I think it might be kind of nice if uh, you're not layering on a whole bunch of other independent tools, especially just this, this fall and maybe spring, right? Um, it, and so helpful. for myself, like um, I look as, I, you know, for me, I look at the LMS that, that the university puts in place, whatever LMS is be as the um, totem pole that I can attach things to it. Um, and so usually when I've, when I've taught in the past, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in the one-stop shopping and send students to, um, you know, the LMS first to find uh, the most relevant information. Um, speaking to Angela and Katie, um, you know, if I were to be teaching, if I were to teach something in, um, at PSU, I would use the LMS for, you know, assignment submission, um, information gathering, and, you know, documents and things like that. Um, and the last thing, and then I would, for me, I would see myself using Moodle, uh, sorry, using Teams as the communication channel. When I want to send out announcements, when I want to have uh, a way for students to communicate within groups, um, I would probably implement Teams like that. Um, one of the things that we were doing at Arizona State when I left was they had integrated Slack, which is Microsoft Teams competitor, into their learning management system, so it was already built in. Um, and so instructors were doing that of, of having Slack there for instantaneous communication um, and then having the LMS for other things that they, they can have, students can go to in regards to where to submit assignments, where to take a quiz and things like that. What are students going to be used to? Um, the most top one is probably going to be Moodle. Um, I can't give you any hard numbers, but um, Moodle is the LMS that we have here at, at PSU, and it's what, you know, the go-to for instructors who do use the LMS is what they utilize as, as Moodle because that's what we prefer, and it's free, and that's what's here, and the students upload them, you know, the students are automatically uploaded. Um, so that's, you know, what students are going to be familiar with. What like Robin said, you know, Moodle would probably be number two, uh, number one, and then possibly teams would be number two as some instructors did start adopting it um, for COVID and when COVID happened and then Zoom if uh, instructors were util uh, to utilize that during that, during that time. I have a quick question. It might be more for Robin. So I think I've seen in the reopening task force report maybe something about having a uh, course templates in Moodle? Uh, that was one thing that was discussed. Unfortunately, um, the software in Moodle doesn't really allow that to have a um, easily course template to, um, to implement. Okay, because as I'm thinking of building my course, I was thinking, well, do I start building it or is it going to be a template that I'll have to follow? Okay, that's, that's good to know. Yeah, and it's it's good. I mean, we don't want to go down that slippery slope of the Moodle course template because the moment you start going down that slippery slope, it's a fine line before everybody's course 
looks like a cookie cutter of everybody else's course. And then pretty soon we're teaching these online, you know, um, cookie cutter courses that can be transferred all over the institution. And then pretty soon you don't even need teachers to teach them. I will say the, that's you know, a slippery slope, you know, that's probably associated also with my paranoia, but you know, we, you, we, you want your sites to reflect your personality, your disciplines requirements, yes. the kinds of activities that you do with your students and the ways your course work. Um, that is actually the job of people like Jason as an academic technologist and Martha as a designer um, is to sit with you and have you say, here's how I teach, here's what I need my students to do. And then we say, okay, it looks like this kind of a team would be good and this kind of a Moodle site and let's build them. Um, and then they'll really work the way that you need. And I just wanna put in a plea for people who mostly just put a syllabus on Moodle and don't do too much else. Part of what you might need and your students will only thank you for it is a very simplified online environment. Mm -hmm. um, so the point is not to build the most creative and exciting thing that's ever been seen, but something that's super useful to you and your students. And so that might mean building something that's really only has two things and it's very simple and very clean. Um, so that's the kind of thing that the way you do that is you either, um, if you really want it to be Moodle based, you talk with Jason, if you're not sure yet and you want more input, you talk with Martha right on the CoLab website. Um, we have make an appointment with us and that's the kind of thing you make an hour long appointment. And probably by the time you leave that hour long appointment, you can have uh, the beginning of that pretty good architecture um, going. So don't feel like if this is kind of new for you that you have to do all this on your own. Um, we, you know, that's actually people's jobs, at least for now, it's our jobs. <laughs> so let, put us to work and we can, we can help you. I would say one of the, one of the best things you can do to make your life easier if you use an LMS is be consistent in your layout and then be consistent in your naming. Um, if you call, you know, if you call it assignment one in your syllabus, don't call it assignment A in Moodle. Um, that's really the, one of the biggest things I can tell you is be consistent in how you lay it out and be consistent in how you name things. Um, just because that, and then be consistent on what you call it when you're verbally tell your students. Um, I've had too many encounters with students where they're trying to find something and I'm not saying here, just here at Plymouth, but in general working at instructors where they're trying, a student's trying to find something in their Moodle or Canvas and they don't know what to look for because there's instructor referred it to something different when they're explaining it in class. So just consistency will probably eliminate 90% of your problems um, of student questions. The other thing I found helpful for thinking about, you know, if we need to kind of go online quickly, um, or if you're gonna teach parts of your class online, which maybe you're less familiar with having done, is that remember it's not just um, the content that has to be transmitted, it's also all of the instructions for everything. So um, one thing I think can be really helpful, it's one of the reasons that in this ACE framework course, every Monday we're gonna have a video orientation where we kind of walk you through things. So you could think of doing something like a five minute video walkthrough of the week's work, um, or you could post every Monday, here are the instructions for the week. Um, but being consistent with that kind of stuff, which is not the content, the discipline of your course, but it's the stuff we usually take for granted face to face, because that is the stuff that is so much easier when you're just gonna see somebody, right? You can just explain it all. Um, but the other thing they need is a channel to write back when you think you've explained it really clearly, but they don't understand. So you want a place where you can tell them the instructions and also a very clear place where they can question your instructions. Um, so in this team, it's our video orientation every Monday. And then it's that open discussion channel that we watch like a hawk. You know, sometimes people are just chit chatting, but if you look in there right now, you'll see there's a million questions about, I don't know where this is and I didn't know how to do this. And, um, so you got to identify in especially online environments where that kind of conversation is going to happen. Yes. Can I ask a question? 
No. Nope. <laughs> oh, I lost myself. Okay. So um, uh, I'm actually teaching an online class now and have in the past used um, online discussion forums in Moodle, which kind of suck and I'm trying to improve them. And I know part of that's like what types of questions you're asking, sort of the parameters you set up with students. But I'm just curious if, um, if anyone has ever used Teams as an alternative for that. I find myself kind of overwhelmed with the discussions in our various teams, like the one for the workshop, because it gets really long and then like you don't see the full posts, so it's kind of shortened, so you can kind of miss bits. So I'm just curious if anyone has any experience with that. I, I can speak a little bit to that. I did not, so I've, I have never taught using Teams. Um, the only opportunity I would have had was doing Intro to IDS last spring, and I decided not to introduce it when we were face-to-face -face and deeply regretted that um, once we went online because I think it could have been a really useful um, communication channel because so many students were telling me that e their email was just a dumpster fire. Um, but so I haven't taught with Teams, but I have taught with Slack before, which is, um, as Jason said, Teams main competitor and um, feature wise is very, very similar to Teams. Um, and what I have had to um, kind of get both give myself permission for and give students permission to in the way that conversation um, develops in Slack is that the goal is not necessarily to read everything. Um, similar to if you were in a classroom with 20 students and people were having different conversations, everybody wouldn't be listening to what everybody was saying and commenting on what everybody was saying. Um, and yes, part of the reality of that is that you sometimes miss stuff. Um, it's, this, it's similar for those of us who are on Twitter that, you know, when you first get started on Twitter and you're not following many people, it's really easy to read everything. And then before you know it, it's just a flood of content. And there is no way other than like quitting your job and your family and everything else in your life to read it all. Um, and so you have to kind of adjust your mindset and your expectations to one of dipping in and dipping out and contributing when you can and also trusting that the best stuff tends to reemerge again and again and again. And, and, and trying to figure out how to make that happen in your class I think is really important too. So letting the conversation in those channels be a little bit more organic, encouraging students to engage with the things that really resonate with them, but also encouraging them to bring to the larger group's attention um, stuff maybe that's getting lost in the mix. Um, and like in terms of the, you know thinking how that is analogous to face to face can be a little bit tricky, and it won't be exactly um, because it's different mediation. Um, but there are some an analogous um, some ways to compare those two things that I think can be helpful. Um, but really, for me, it's about it's really about a mind a mindset shift for myself and helping my students to shift that mindset a little bit too. And it's a little bit different than what we're used to with discussion forums too, because discussion forums are so much more static. Um, and frankly, I think it's one of the reasons why a lot of students balk at them is that they don't feel vibrant, right? It really like feels like you're going through a checklist of things. Whereas what happens in Teams, what happens in Slacks, in Slacks, in Slack <laughs> tends to feel a lot more, um, sort of emergent. Yes. And, and so that requires a more dance. emergent approach. I don't know if that helps, but that's my thought. Also, I want to point out like in the ACE workshop, you can see that both your private mentor group and those discussion channels are all channels, right? But they function really differently. So you can use channels. Um, lots of classes, I think, use them in very project-based ways. So they're group works that um, they only have maybe four or five people in the channel and they are doing a task and it's very focused and, or you may use it kind of like a Moodle discussion board. And as long as you're a little clever about how you sort those channels, um, those are two very different ways of using them, right? Project management and group work versus those replacement discussion boards. Um, I'll call on Angela now. Mm -hmm. So, is there a way, I assume that there is, but I don't know how to do it in Teams so that you can 
see the activity of individual students? Like, are they participating? Are they not participating? Like, which, which discussion are they a part of? Not that I'm aware of, because, um, you know, Teams wasn't really meant to, you know, track people like that. Um, it wasn't, you know, that's, that's a, a more educational mindset to be like, hey, who's contributing? Or how's it, how's it contributing? Um, and so, unfortunately, there's, to the best of my knowledge, there's no tracking mechanism like that. Um, um, what, one thing that I thought of on that score, because I'm thinking about using teams for, uh, for a lot of asynchronous discussion is, um, I'm already doing course websites for, for each of my students. Well, we've got a larger course website, but my students are going to do personal websites for all of their projects. Um, before the pandemic, I had already been doing something similar to this where students did preparatory questions and sort of like a little bit of reflection before class discussions. Given the issue with teams that you just brought up um, and, and, and lack of tracking and stuff, I think I'm going to have like post discussion reflections and ask them to come up with a little bit of writing on whatever sort of discussion they had, whether that was in class or asynchronous through teams or what have you. So to sort of like build in a writing tracking component without needing to count comments on teams. Um, and so, and then, you know, you can set up a channel specifically for that, like they, like we've done in the uh, in the ACE team channel, you know, team setup. We have a specific channel set up for week one reflection. So you know, if you want to find that reflection, you know that place to go. Um, one nice thing about Teams is that it does have a search feature up at the top, and so if you want to search for a specific word or a specific topic, you can put in that search, and the, you know you can find that history uh, of that. So the fun thing for me is when I first started here in at Plymouth, uh, you bet the second day I started, I went and searched my last name to see what people said about me uh, before I got hired. Robin, I'm looking at you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, other questions? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Um...